Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part three of my visit to ESA's Open Day, and here I encountered three astronauts that I know all too well. It turns out that a love for Kerbal Space Program is pretty much an international part of the international space effort. Okay, okay where are we then? All right, Scott, we are in the exoplanet area. But oh, I love exoplanets. Um, this is Kate Isaacs, project scientist nice on the you. Chaos mission. So Chaos! I'll tell you all about our newest mission. Chaos stands for Characterising Exoplanet Satellite. It's a small mission, as you can see, this is a scale model which is half size. Oh, half size, okay. okay. That's still pretty small for a satellite. It's still small for a satellite. It weighs about 300 kilos, so whilst it's about as tall as I am, it's uh, quite a bit heavier, thank goodness. Right. And but so what's the instruments on this then? We have one instrument on Chaos, uh, and it's, it's a photometer basically, it's a telescope which feeds the light and we measure into, onto a CCD. Right, and so it's doing do, light curves. Exactly, yeah. we're measuring the light curves of stars that are known to host exoplanets. So we're looking to measure very precisely the sizes of of small planets, so Earth size to super Earth size to new, uh, Neptune. And the point is because we know when they transit and where, and where to point, we can be very efficient. See. We don't have to stare for long periods of time. We just observe around the time of transit, before and afterwards, because it's a relative measurement that we make. Yeah. And then from that, from the size of the dip, if we know the very, if we measure that very accurately, and we know the size of the star from, for example, Gaia, we yeah. can then determine the the um, size of the planet. Yeah, so we planet. have this database of yes. thousands, of yes. thousand exoplanets, yes. and you're just going to sit here and you know when these transit, so yes. you're going to go blip, 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 Indeed. catch them all. There, there are more than 4,000 planets that are known, but we will focus on bright stars, and again, the smaller, the smaller planets. We hope in our three and a half uh, year mission lifetime, we will observe three between three and four hundred typically uh, a, a star um, cool i like the idea of this thing just sitting and waiting and knowing where it has to we, point at which time no i mean we will be very i mean we won't do so much waiting yeah. i mean we've been doing some preliminary scheduling based on the targets that we have and i think we'll be observing uh, exoplanet transits for more than 90 percent of the the time that we're up there Back in the Expo Museum, which is not part of Open Day, there was this mangled piece of hardware. Well, two mangled piece of hardware. These are debris from the cluster satellites which flew on Ariane 5. And you probably heard this story from me because it's one of my favourite stories, uh, even although it was a terrible problem. So this is a model of the Ariane 4. If you remember my video on the Viking engine, it had four of those. It was much closer to the Ariane 1. Of course, it was trying to keep up with launch payload requirements, and they began to develop a new bigger rocket, the Ariane 5. This was a radical redesign using solid rocket boosters and a liquid hydrogen engine, but to save time, they used the same computer and the same flight software, and due to uh, an integer overflow, they managed to lose control of the spacecraft and it exploded on its very first flight. So that mangled pile of junk in the museum, that for me is a literal artifact warning against the dangers of legacy code. Incidentally, the flight computer isn't on display in the museum, but it was also recovered. Of course, since then, the Ariane 5 has gone on to become an exceptionally successful rocket. If you need to put something heavy into geostationary orbit, the Ariane 5 is currently the best choice you have out there. So now we're with Louisa in the center, and you're here. You want to talk about clean space, cleaning up space? Yes, I yes. am. And also not making dirty. Not making it dirty As in space well. or on the Earth in general. Uh, both. Both. Because uh, you don't want a satellite to fall from space and bonk, bump into people. No. And you don't want it to hit another satellite. So this everything that ESA is launching now has to be check for these possibilities, right? Yes. So you have to have a plan for end of life on spacecraft? Yes. There are rules which are actually worldwide rules mm -hmm. and we are trying to implement in a more and more efficient way. So you, at the end of life you need, you need to get your satellite out of the protected zone mm -hmm. and you need to discharge the batteries so that they will not explode, so they will not create lots of debris, and uh, and then get the satellite down. And there are two ways to get the satellite down. 
could be what we call uncontrolled, which basically means we don't know where it's going to fall down. Mm -hmm. And so it will burn coming down, uh, most of it. Yeah. Or if in the satellite is too big and uh, there is uh, too many pieces f falling down, we need to drive it into the ocean. Into so. the Point Nemo, the middle of the Pacific where nobody else is, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. But if it's going to fall down everywhere, anywhere else, you need to make sure that as much of the spacecraft meets its demise, hence the word yes, demisability. It's a fabulous word. I don't know who came up with it, but I, I love it as an expression. I don't know. I, I, I When I started to use it, I didn't even know it, about it. I didn't but know how to pronounce it when I saw it, but as soon as I heard it pronounced, it made total exactly, sense. Exactly, exactly. I don't even know if it is more English or American, but yeah. it's uh, it seems that for English-speaking people, it was quite normal yeah. to call it demisability. Yeah, okay, just, then we just, started. yeah, we throw words together and, and it started. kind of makes up. But, I mean, obviously you then have to throw science at the problem and make your parts so that they don't aren't going to remain solid during re-entry. And I think there's a few examples here. Yes. The, the, uh, the issue is that we don't know, we didn't study in detail how the things burn down during the re-entry. So... Because we didn't care about the end of life. And now we do. So what we have to understand is how do they burn. And here you can see some example. Yeah. And you can see how a big piece, which is a magnetotorker. A magnetorker and a, a small, to turn a satellite. And it uses magnetism. Yes. So it has a big ferrite core, which is basically iron. Yes, which doesn't burn very it well. It doesn't burn very well. But we, I mean, what does it mean very well? Uh, uh, how much and all the rest. So we tested it. We put it in a wind tunnel. A plasma wind tunnel, right? Yes. And then we threw at it a flux, a heat flux, which should simulate the same trajectory as a satellite coming down. And we saw what it survived. And we saw that from the big pieces, we went down to the small pieces. But there's still but a those piece. those would still hurt you if they hit exactly. you in the head. Exactly. Yeah, so That's the problem. That this piece falling down at the speed it does, it would kill you anyway. Oh, okay. So the problem is, uh, that's the reason why we are trying to understand how things burn mm -hmm. in order to design them in a different way. And I guess the funny thing about this is these plasma wind tunnels, they were originally designed to test uh, heat shields for re-entry to make sure the spacecraft didn't fail. Yes. And now you're doing the reverse. You're trying to make sure that things like this bearing yes. uh, will disintegrate and leave as little as possible. That obviously, again is uh, not something you want hitting your house no. or hitting your person or anything. No. Now, uh, active like debris cleanup, uh, do you look at that as well? Yes, we do. Do you want to move to the next stand sure, or so not? Let's move to the next stand and look at some active, uh, you know, demi active, what do you call it, spacecraft hunting, right? Yes. We're I hunting know. spacecraft. Yes, we do. Uh, no, we are hunting debris. Hunt oh, well. Uh, well, because spacecraft yeah, becomes a piece of debris exactly. once it stops responding. Exactly. So a debris is either a small one, but it could also be a very big spacecraft. Right. It's still a debris because by definition, debris means I don't control the satellite anymore. Mm -hmm. It's dead. Yeah. But so it could is... be one unique piece. Yeah. This is the biggest debris which belongs to ESA. It's Ambisat. It's an eight-ton satellite. And it's still uh, stuck in orbit it's still for stuck like a... six, seven years now? It's been unresponsive? Uh, something like that. And it will stay there for 200 years, most probably. But if you could bring it down in the exact place, you'd prefer that as an option? Yes, definitely. First of all, because... Uh, we would know. Uh, we would demonstrate that you can remove the big debris, and it's a fantastic m mission because it's very difficult. Or, uh, and because then we would be sure that it would fall in the ocean, so no risk for the uh, uh, population. Yeah, and so an eight-ton spacecraft is going to make a big, you know, dent if it lands somewhere. Yes. So uh, this one is covered in a net, which is presumably one particular option that you've investigated, but. Is it the only one? No, we invited to get, um, I would say, three options. One is a robotic arm. But in order to capture a spacecraft with a robotic arm, you need to get close to the spacecraft. Well, the spacecraft, the debris, yeah. which doesn't move in a controlled way. It's uncontrolled. So it's spinning, possibly. It's spinning, but we don't even know exactly how because we cannot see it from ground. And so, it's not telling you either. Exactly. So, because it's dead. So yeah. we need to go up there with our small chaser. Normally the chaser is smaller. And then we need to observe the satellite. 
The chairs are to do all this calculation on board, mostly by itself, understanding, oh, the satellite is moving this way, and therefore it means that I can approach it in this way, in a safe way. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a robotic arm, you need to go as close as uh, five meters, yep. so it's extremely really dangerous, and second, uh, there's another point that it's very uh, difficult with the robotic arm. It is that you need to put your chaser in the same motion as the debris, what we call synchronized, synchronized motion. Synchronized motion, yeah. Because in this way, when you, the arm is extended and capture it, it will not be torn away by the forces. And this is an eight-ton spacecraft. If it was spinning, it would have a significant amount of angular momentum that yes. you would have to get rid of. You can't just have a small satellite grab it. Whatever it is has to be able to counteract and dissipate that. Exactly. And, and therefore, the, the design of the joints of the robotic arm is one of the critical aspects. But the advantage is that once you capture it, you can attach yourself very well yeah. to it. You know where it's the center of mass, and then you push it down in the ocean. And that's a maneuver that we know how to do it. Yes. With the net, there is a, it's different. You stay away. We were even thinking something 50 kilometers away. Okay? Oh. Then you throw this enormous net which needs to open and close in microgravity. So this is the first difficulty. But we have done some tests in the parabolic flight and we have simulated how a net opens and closes. So we think we know how to master that part. There are, there are, this net doesn't have it, but there are small balls attached to the angles. So right. that the, the, the net entangles. That's a very a old bit. trick dating Excellent. to like Roman times, you know? Excellent. Going all the way back in European history, right? Uh, and then once you have capture, on the other hand, you are attached with a tether. And I always say it's like maneuvering a kite. <laughs> and uh, it's not obvious. So what we, in this case, what we still need to master would be the maneuver to make it re-enter, the pulling. Phase. Right, how to maneuver with something attached in a very exactly. long line. Exactly. Yeah, that... Uh, and it's a, even more complicated than this. I can tell you another small detail, for example. Oh, more details are always... Uh, yeah, <laughs> but because uh, it's difficult, it is difficult. For example, one of the issues is that usually you have the knight in the back, let's say, and you have your thruster there. And you have a tether getting out. And your thrusters are thrusting on the, on the tether, so it will burn it by itself. It would be very stupid yeah. to have uh, your own thruster burning the tether. Yeah. So we, you need to orient the thruster in a different way, which makes it even more complicated. Yeah. Wow. Well, that is absolutely fascinating. I wish you the best of luck hunting Envisat. And uh, I hope it comes home. Well, I don't say safely, safely for us, but not yes. for it. <laughs> yes, no, we need, to we need to destroy it. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fly safe, right?